I'm going to uh, talk today about um, 2D uh, line chain analysis of, of biomolecular interactions. Um, and, and really, this, this talk you know, has, although we're going to get towards 2D analysis and there'll be a focus on biomolecular interactions, uh, this will really uh, also sort of touch on sort of several aspects that are, are a bit more general and you know, kind of applications, for example, to you know, you know, supramolecular chemistry, um, other kinds of, of interactions. Um, so, you know, the first point I want to sort of you know, Im impress on you, I'm sure everyone here is, is aware of this, but your know, NMR titrations really are very information rich. You get a lot of uh, detail contained in them, not just on structure of interactions through chemical shifts, um, but also on the, the molecular weight um, changes through change in line widths, certainly in thermodynamics through the, the KD that you want to get out of titration measurements, but also uh, on the kinetics, um, so you can fish in the barrier heights, through you know, fast exchange, slow exchange, um, and also on the mechanism. So your NMR you know, resonances and their, their behavior across titrations is really sensitive to, um, to the particular mechanisms of interaction. So the sort of, you know, overview of this sort of, you know, talk, um, talk today is that I'm gonna start going through some of the, the theory, some of it's uh, pretty well known, um, and then some that's a little more specialist on you know, chemical exchange in NMR and how we then apply that to line shape analysis in 1D, 2D. Um, we'll then pause for questions and then uh, take a, a look at a sort of practical demonstration of some analysis software that we put together to do this kind of analysis. And we'll discuss some sort of tips and tricks both for the analysis and for acquiring experiments themselves. Um, and then uh, depending on how time goes, we can then, there are a number of, sort of more advanced topics that we can, that we can touch on. Um, so I'm actually, I'm going to the opera for uh, the first time in a very long time tonight. So uh, we, there's, there's a limit, so we can't, uh, can't run on too far, uh, but really looking forward to that. So uh, if we get started, so you're talking about chemical exchange, um, and we're really going to be thinking about chemical exchange in the context of um, molecular interactions at um, titration experiments. So you know, the most basic sort of your titration we're thinking about, your know, interaction you know, is interaction between you know, a large, you know, large molecule, you know, protein molecule P, and you know, some smaller uh, ligand uh, to form you know, a, you know, a complex, some sort of you know, protein ligand um, complex here. Um, of course, you know, these uh, these interactions you know, occur through an encounter complex, and you know, there's a lot of uh, lovely work from you know, various NMR groups using NMR to study these things, chloral groups and uh, Martin Blackman and so forth. Um, but you know, these are just the most basic kinds of interaction mechanisms. You know, NMR is also very good at looking at more advanced, uh, more complex mechanisms, such as conformational selection, where you've got transitions you know, in your protein before it interacts between the ground state, excited state, conformation. And of course, you're going to have conformational changes after the interaction occurs. So you're going to have an induced fit where you get uh, your know, change to higher affinity. Um, you know, NMR titrations are also very good for looking at um, things like dimerization. Um, so in this case, we've got formation of an asymmetric dimer. Um, and we can do other things where we can look at competition experiments. We can see, um, you know, which, um, you know, look at the binding to multiple ligands. Um, although in this case, we can see that which one is the, the higher affinity ligand. Uh, for those who are wondering, this is our, our dog, Bo. So he's a, an arrival during lockdown. So uh, to get a little bit more serious, so we're going to look at, um, for, for much of this talk, we're going to focus on the very simplest kind of interactions. We're going to be looking at the interaction of a protein you know, with a ligand P to form a complex uh, PL. And this is characterized by a KD, the dissociation constant. And there are two exchange rates associated with this, you know, the K on and the K off, so the association dissociation rate. And this is what we see at the biochemical level. We've got these different species. But at the level of spins, we need to focus on the protein that we're observing. We need to think about the protein nuclei and the different contributions they go through. So in terms of spin states, we've got A spins, which are the free protein, and then with the B spins states, which are you know, the protein in its complex. And you know, we want to look at the, the rate at which these are interconverting. So these are, you, know, you get your forwards rate, KAB, and you get your backwards rate, KBA. And each of these states, A and B, have got associated with these characteristic frequencies, you know, which arise in the chemical shift. These are, are field dependent. And they've got relaxation rates. They've got R, R2s in particular, um, we, will, we will be interested in. Uh, just a little point right now, all the frequencies that you know, we'll be thinking about are going to be in angular units. 
um, so in radians per second or per second and not in not in hertz uh, it just clears things up a bit so when we're looking at these you know at the um, level of the, the spins and we need to think about these transition rates the keb kbe so the backwards rate is pretty straightforward that is just the the dissociation rate the k off there's no difference there but the forwards rate is going to be dependent on the ligand concentration and it's going to be dependent on the free ligand concentration. So this, this is the difference between looking at the kind of molecular level where you have a second order association rate, but at the level of the spins, everything is in, is uh, first order. And at equilibrium, you everything really can be reduced to, to first order reactions. We've got our um, forwards rate, which is related to the amount of free ligand. And the free ligand can be calculated then based on what KD is and the various concentrations around. So this is a very important consequence, which is that um, the forwards rate, the KB, increases through the titration. So as we add in ligand, um, the free ligand concentration is initially zero, but as the titration proceeds, while it initially the ligand binds onto proteins, there's not much of an increase. Uh, as the titration proceeds, you can have free ligand around, so the forwards rate is going to increase. Um, and it's really useful to define um, what we call the exchange rate kx, which is the sum of the forwards and the backwards rates. Um, and this increases uh, through the course of a titration. So I've simulated an example here where you have you know, a 20 micromolar um, affinity, 100 micromolar protein concentration as we titrate in the ligand. Sorry, it's a, a typo. This is the ligand concentration on the x-axis. Then we have an increase in the fraction bound. But the exchange rate we can also see is increasing from at zero concentration, just the K off, and then as it goes through, we're going to increase. And you know, we want to be comparing this to the frequency difference between our spins. So the delta omega, which you know, in this case, for example, um, a half a ppm difference in the proton, 800 megahertz, that's about 2,500 per second. So, um, and depending on whether your exchange rates are faster or slower than this, then you get very different appearance of your spectra. Um, so this, this is really what is, is fundamental to understanding your know, chemical exchange in, in NMR and in titrations. So we can look at what happens if we vary the dissociation in a titration. We've simulated a, a titration here, again, at 100 micromolar, 20 micromolar KD, at increasing concentrations of ligand from you know, free protein going over the protein complex. Um, when the exchange rate is very slow, then we just see Two states we've got a lump of p and then you know, that intensity goes down and intensity comes up at the bound states this is pretty much what you get with optical titrations you see a snapshot of one state and you see a snapshot of another state and the, the amounts are you know, the intensities are proportional to uh, the amount of stuff you've got uh, however as the exchange rate gets faster then you get um, more interesting exchange behavior uh, coming up as this goes back and forth so you can see that you, know, you get broadening um, we're in the, what we say, the intermediate exchange regime where you have fairly significant broadening. And then as we carry on, we get towards a fast exchange regime where now you know, our intensities are much higher um, and we're going towards, uh, we can see frequency shifts towards the bound state. But of course, this stops a little bit short because we're not reaching full saturation at these living concentrations. Um, we can also look at what happens if we uh, actually just vary the chemical shift difference. So as we increase the chemical shift difference, then we can see that you know, we move from uh, fast exchange into a kind of your slower exchange regime where we see these two peaks. So here we've got single peaks in the transition and about here they start to divide into two separate peaks. Um, it is interesting to note that as these uh, peaks move apart from each other, uh, the intensity of the bound state on the right hand side does not increase again. So it doesn't, uh, it doesn't come back up to match the, the free state. Um, so we'll, we'll come back to this, but uh, you might want to be thinking in the back of your minds why that could be the case. So to take some of these cases, you know, turn, turn by turn. So we have the fast exchange. This is probably the most well-known limit. So here you, you see, you know, for a very rapid dissociation, gives you a very fast exchange back and forth. Um, we can see that you have a frequency dependent, um, or, or the, the frequency of your resonance, or your single resonance, and that shifts towards the foldy state, uh, the bound state. Um, as you titrate in the ligand. And if we follow the chemical shift perturbation, uh, which is picked out in blue, then it matches the, exactly the fraction bound. Uh, so this is pretty straightforward, provides a readout of the amount of stuff that you have. 
Um, as the exchange gets a little bit slower, um, so the, the delta omega here, I should say, is um, uh, two and a half thousand per second. So we're about fourfold above it here. Um, as that gets a little bit slower, the chemical shift changes um, still track very nicely with the amount of binding we have, but we get some, some broadening in the middle here. So this is exchange broadening. And in the fast exchange limit, um, this is uh, related to uh, the populations um, of the bound states. So the product of these is, is highest in the middle of the titration. So you have the most broadening in the middle. Um, it's inversely proportional to the exchange rate. So as the exchange gets slower, this becomes more significant. And it's related to the, the chemical shift difference or the frequency difference. So this is you know, more significant when you have a large frequency difference and more important than higher magnetic field strengths. And uh, you, you can see it gets stronger and stronger. And then uh, you get to a point where you uh, reach an intermediate exchange. So now uh, the off rate or the exchange rate becomes sort of comparable to the, um, uh, to the frequency difference. Uh, you can see here, although there's not much of a, you know, a change on the left-hand side in the spectra between these two cases, uh, you now reach this point at which the chemical shift perturbations uh, really do not represent the fraction bound. Um, so you've got this kind of divergence in the behavior. Um, it's not necessarily easy to tell from your spectra if you're in a kind of position where this would be the case. So you might think, well, this is you know, just about fast exchange. You can follow these shift differences. Um, but if you were to use this for analyzing a titration, you'd get uh, fairly inaccurate results. Um, on the other extreme, in the slow exchange limit, um, if you have very slow exchange, you know, one per second, then your intensities, you know, give you a very good you know, measure of, you know, the amount of unbound, the amount of bound stuff you've got, and you know, these, these track very nicely with the actual amount of, of binding. Um, however, as the exchange gets a little bit faster, uh, you can see that the amount of the signal in the bound state on the right-hand side, you know, the intensity never reaches uh, what you have uh, before in the free state. Um, and that becomes more significant as your exchange gets a little bit faster. So we're 100 per second, still a good deal slower, a uh, good deal less than the frequency difference. Um, but we've got significant broadening in the bound state. And this is lifetime line broadening. So in the slow exchange limit, your exchange contribution is actually the off rate. So as the off rate becomes larger, then you find that you've actually got you know, more broadening, so your intensities don't recover. The amplitudes of these peaks will still be the same if you integrate, but the, the peaks themselves become a bit broader. On the other hand, um, the product, uh, sorry, the starting material, the free protein P, um, is much sharper, and that's because the lifetime line broadening here is the forwards rate. And you know, at the early stage of the titration, you know, that's um, very slow because the free ligand concentration is, is close to zero because all the ligand is actually going on to form the complex. So you get much sharper lines at the beginning of the titration, but the final peaks are, are broader. Um, if the exchange is a little bit faster, then you can get situations where you start to cross over. So you might start off in this low exchange regime, um, but you then end up um, getting a little bit faster. So you can see here, um, if you look closely, you have peaks coming up here in the slow exchange. These are coming up at the position of the, of the bound state. But as the exchange gets faster, these are actually moving back towards the initial state. So the, the chemical shift perturbation is getting smaller. And that's because you're moving into a fast exchange regime. Uh, your intensities are fairly slow. If you were to go to even higher equivalents to really saturate the binding, you know, very strongly saturate the binding, as you can see here, then the intensity comes back up. And you know, these peaks, the product state will eventually move back over towards the bound state because you've shifted the equilibrium. Um, so far across. But you can see even in kind of your 1D cases, the very simplest titration, you get some sort of fairly interesting effects on line widths. So, you know, we can ask you know, what sort of conditions, you know, can we expect line shape analysis to be useful? What ranges of, of rate constants? And, you know, we need to compare you know, our, our rate constants to the frequency difference uh, to answer this. Um, so if our, you know, we can plot here, you know, essentially the, the same uh, simulation we had before, but now indicating the ratio of the dissociation rates and the frequency difference. So at, um, you know, a very slow exchange, then um, there's little that you can say about the speed of the titration. You can work out how much binding you've got, but we can't get too much more from the, the NMR than that because, you know, 
the exchange is just too slow. We've lost all information. However, as the exchange becomes a little bit faster, maybe in the order of kind of your, your 50 to one, your sort of frequency difference, then we can start to see we're getting some effects here that we could expect to pick up. Um, and as we go forward to, towards a faster exchange, clearly in, in the intermediate exchange regime, you get a lot of information. As we go forwards, then you know, here we can pick out something, but as the exchange gets much faster, then there becomes a limit to, to what we could expect to pick out. So you're maybe looking for a line shape analysis you know, to apply when you get rates within something like 50 fold of the frequency difference. But it's worth bearing in mind, particularly when you do 2D analysis, that you've got you know, 100, 200 different residues in the protein. You know, you've got you know, 50 different methyl groups, depending on what you're looking at. So you, know, you just need one of these peaks to have a chemical shift change in the right side of the region for you to get a, you know, a useful range. So you know, if you've got kind of your chemical shift perturbations varying from you know, you know, 0.1, you know, 0.01 ppm up to you know, 1 ppm, you know, this gives you an enormous range of sensitivity to, to different rates and, and different equilibria. So this is what makes line shape analysis you know, and NMR titration such a powerful technique. So how do we actually calculate these, these line shapes uh, and in 1D? So if we start off, we can look at the, the block equations. This is purely classical model. Um, so this is the vector model treatment. Um, in the absence of any chemical exchange, there's just a single state. Um, what we can see is that you've got um, you know, a magnetization vector, so M, and we're looking at the X, Y, Z components. So these are, are relaxing with R2s, R1s. You've got omega naught, your frequency difference, and then omega X and omega Y are describing the effect of RF pulses. Um, now, for the analysis of line shapes, we're interested in free evolution. So this simplifies, and we just set these to zero. Uh, and we're also generally looking at conditions where transverse relaxation is much faster than longitudinal relaxation. So we can forget about the Z component, and we just focus now on the X, Y plane. So our problem becomes simpler. And in fact, we can then take our X, Y component, and we can combine these uh, into you know, a complex number representing the magnetization in the transverse plane. So you know, X plus you know, I times the, the Y component. And then the evolution of this you know, is described um, fairly simply as you know, the you know, I times the frequency, you know, and then you know, subtracting off the relaxation rate. So you get a very simple first order differential equation, and you know, this is solved as the exponential. So you've got you know, you've got the, the precession, you know, frequency omega, and you've got the relaxation uh, according to the R2 rate. And you, know, you can calculate this if you know your parameters, know your starting magnetization. And if you then take this and do the Fourier transform, then of course you get your uh, frequency domain spectra. Um, and you get your complex inputs giving you your complex frequency spectrum output, but then you then take the, take the real part to get the signal that you're interested in. So if we get two species, um, not in chemical exchange, um, then you can expand this treatment you know, very elegantly just using matrix form. So you can um, say that you've got your, your A magnetization, your B magnetization. And just as before, your A magnetization processes with some frequency A and relaxation rate, RA, and your B magnetization you know, processes this own frequency and relaxation rate. So we can write this in a more compact notation, you know, where we have the, uh, the offset matrices and the relaxation matrices. And the solution to this you know, can be you know, represented you know, in exactly the same form as the single spin, but this is now a matrix equation. Um, and this is the matrix uh, exponential. Um, so, you know, th but this is very straightforward. You know, this is something you can easily calculate you know, as a standard function in MATLAB, Python, Julia, whatever kind of your, your language you want to, to use to, to study these. So th this is easy to calculate. And your initial magnetization here is proportional to the equilibrium concentrations of these different species. So however much A you've got, however much B you've got. So now we can ask what happens when we have chemical exchange. Uh, sorry, I should say the observed magnetization you get is then the sum of all of these signals. And you know, in matrix form, we can take the sum just by multiplying by this uh, you know, row vector of, of ones. We'll take the sum, which we then Fourier transform and get the spectrum. So when we get chemical exchange, if we think um, in terms of the, the molecular picture, um, 
we can write down rate equations for how our, our A state changes. So we're going to lose you know, A spins. Um, they're going to turn into B, and that's going to happen with rate KAB. And then we're going to gain A spins, and they're going to come from B, so proportional to the meta B, uh, with rate KBA. And then you get a similar analysis for the, the B spins. Um, we can write this in terms of the magnetization you know, in a matrix form, similar to before. This is just you um, transferring this across. And it is worth noting, I mentioned this before, but you know, when you're at equilibrium and your NMR is, is always looking at chemical equilibrium, then you can always write your kinetics in a linear form. They're, they're first order, so you're always close to equilibrium, so you're never far away. Um, so you know, this, this can always be linearized. You don't have more complex kinetics than this when you're um, looking at equilibrium by NMR. So we can now combine these, uh, these exchange um, you know, equations into the Blochner equations that we had, and this gives rise to the Blochner-Connor equations. So we've added in to our original matrix picture now these um, exchange terms. Uh, and we can write this again as a matrix, you know, you know, compact matrix notations. We add in this exchange operator or exchange super operator, depending how fancy you want to be. And you know, exactly as before, then this is just solved very easily using the matrix exponential. And again, your initial magnetization is proportional to our equilibrium concentrations. But now these equilibrium concentrations, you need to calculate from a chemical model. So if you've got your, your protein ligand interaction, you need to work out you know, how much free protein have you got, how much bound protein have you got. Take these, you know, solve the chemical model, and then plug these into your NMR model to calculate your, your uh, spectrum. And then you know, once you have this, then again, you take your Fourier transform and you've got your spectrum end. So this works really nicely. So we've got this uh, you know, set up now where you can go from a spin system, which is your collection of chemical shifts and relaxation rates, and some chemistry, so KD, a K off. Maybe you've got some sort of more complex model, induced fit, dimerization, whatever it is. You've got your chemistry, and then you can throw these together through the block and crumb equations, and you can spit out your predicted or simulated spectra um, as a function of your different ligand concentration, whatever chemistry you want to have. So the idea of line shape analysis, 1D line shape analysis, is really straightforward. And it's just to say that if you can take this process and simulate it, then we can also go backwards. So we can say we can take a set of observed spectra and we can then ask, well, you know, what chemical shifts, what relaxation rates, what chemistry, what KD, what K-off actually reproduces your observed spectra. And this is really not a new idea. So you know, chemical exchange has been studied in NMR since you know, the early 50s. Um, so you a, a paper from you know, 1956 is the, the first you can find looking at uh, your know, convergence. This is a rotation about an amide. The block McConnell equations themselves came a couple of years later. Um, the first example I can actually find of line shape fitting, of, of taking a spectrum and actually fitting the block and quantum equations uh, came in the late 60s. Uh, this example here, um, looking at rotational um, you know, interconversion between trans gauche conformations. Um, but you know, either way, you can see this is a very well established technique. The approach we've described so far using the block equations, these are completely classical. So these don't describe J coupling, they don't. Um, you account for coupled systems. Um, but it, it's fairly straightforward to extend these to quantum mechanical calculations, either in Hilbert space or you know, Louisville space. Um, exactly the same sort of approach applies. And this was worked out again in the 50s and you know, applied um, you know, to, to simulate fit line shapes you know, in the late 60s. Um, so examples here. So um, th this is straightforward, you know, and this, you know, you know, cases where you get J cups and things is much more common if you're dealing with small molecules or uh, doing real chemistry, where you're looking at proteins or biomolecules, you're generally looking at very simple functional groups that give you singlets because you know, you've labeled your molecule appropriately, you've decoupled and so forth. So generally in biomolecular NMR, we don't need to worry about this sort of more detailed analysis. We can use the bloch macron equations um, to get out our, our line shapes in direct dimensions. Um, just a, a little aside on how we can actually calculate these um, line shapes efficiently. Um, so we can write our, um, we have our block McConnell equations, you know, which is this you know, matrix 
differential equation. If we just lump all these things together into some matrix L and the Lebelian operator, then you know, this is solved, as we said before, with the matrix exponential e to the LT times your starting magnetization. Um, now, to calculate the matrix exponential efficiently, we can diagonalize it. So we take the eigenvalue decomposition um, and you get a diagonal matrix of eigenvalues. The exponential of that is then you know, just the key point is that you take the um, exponential of your matrix of eigenvalues. So this is just uh, a series of numbers. So this is very straightforward. Um, the observed magnetization you've got in the Zen exactly as we wrote before. You know, you're, sum all the different components, and then you get the evolution times, whatever you started with. Um, but if we take the Fourier transform of this, then the only thing that depends on time is this matrix exponential here, which is just this string of, of very simple numbers. This is the only thing that depends on time. And we can actually take the Fourier transform of this directly. So the Fourier transform of this exponential is, is one over the, the time constant minus i times the frequency you're observing. So you, know, you can spit this in and then you know, in a very straightforward way, you can calculate your, your frequency spectra. So this is a, a simple calculation to do um, and, and it's very efficient. So you can do it very rapidly. So to give an example of you know, where this is applied, um, it's a fairly, fairly recent example. It's a collaboration I was involved in with Gary Pilek's group um, at UNC and uh, his, uh, his student, his graduate, Sam Stead Miller. So they introduced um, a fluorine label, a fluorotryptophan, uh, into an SH3 domain that we're then looking at the interaction with four different peptide binding motifs from the, the SOS protein. Um, and we could then do fluorine uh, line shape analysis as they titrated in these different peptides. Um, and fluorine is a really nice nucleus to work with for line shape analysis because there's no natural background. Uh, you can do a 1D, you don't need to worry about anything else being in the way. There's no solvent suppression. Um, and it's a very simple pulse sequence. You pulse and you acquire, so there's no complicated relaxation effects uh, or anything else to keep track of. Um, so this works really nicely and you know, it's very rapid, so you can do these titrations very quickly. Um, and it's very sensitive to the binding. You know, fluorine chemical shifts are extremely sensitive. Um, it's a nice approach. And you can go on, you can look at temperature dependence, you can work on activation energies and so, so forth. Um, so this is just you know, one example of, of many of, of applying 1D line shape analysis, but, but fluorine does provide a nice, uh, a nice case. Um, so in terms of software that's available for, for 1D analysis, you know, this has been around um, a long time. I've got to say the, the software generally has actually been, been pretty poor. This is, this is an area where you know, I think you know, users are, are let down by, by what's easy to do. So there are various tools around um, for looking at titrations. For looking at static spectra, um, I would point you to this link at the bottom, which discusses some other bits of software like DNMR, things are built into Topspin. Um, so you get NMR Kin, which is developed by Ulrich Gunther uh, in Birmingham. Um, I looked, it doesn't actually seem to be available for download anymore, but I'm sure if you get in touch, that'll be available. Um, the main tools that are available at the moment are um, been developed by Evgeny Kovrigan, um, and these are Line Chip Kin or uh, IDAP, which runs in MATLAB. And more recently, he's released a program, NMR Line Guru, uh, which runs online. It's also available in NMR Box. Um, it's, it's the, the models you can apply to analyze are slightly limited, um, but you know, if that fits, then this seems to be a very nice um, approach. Um, the, the other option is just to script it yourself. If you're reasonably comfortable with any sort of coding, then um, this is actually you know, really not difficult to, to write um, scripts that will do any sort of fitting that you would like. Um, and you know, this, this is what we did with the fluorine work um, the previous slide. And you know, if you're at all interested, then you know, don't hesitate to get in touch with me. I can share these, these scripts. They're, they're very straightforward. So how do we go from 1D uh, analysis into to 2D uh, line shape analysis and 2D titration? So, you know, 2D NMR is, is really you know, the, the standard for looking at your know, titrations because you know, with biomolecules, you've got you know, 100 different residues. So you want to be able to track these uh, and resolve these. Um, the interesting thing about 2D NMR is, of course, that you've now got two frequency dimensions. So you've got two different uh, frequency differences. So you, you might want to think about how the exchange regimes uh, are defined. 
and how you can actually apply line shape analysis to, to study these things. So you know, the most common approach is frankly simply to forget about it and you know, assume that you've got fast exchange that you can just follow these differences and that everything will be all right. Uh, and you know, maybe, maybe that's okay, maybe you can get away with that. Um, I think it's even in those cases, you know, it's a bit of a shame because NMR data is expensive, you know, your time is expensive, your samples are valuable, and there's all this extra information available there. So you know, I always think it's a shame not to try and get the most out of your data uh, when it's, it's available. And you know, it might actually you know, throw up some surprises that, you know, hey, you know, this doesn't fit through a simple you know, two-state mechanism, but you, know, you might find that there are some signs of more interesting phenomena. So I would argue it's always worth trying to, to look at this and try and get the most out of your data. So for many years, the, the best approach to this was you know, something I would maybe term you know, one and a half D line shape analysis. And the idea of this is very simple. You just uh, take your 2D spectrum and you can extract some cross sections from this and use these for line shape analysis. And this is the approach that uh, NMR Kin uh, takes from uh, Ulrich Gunther. And it's also the approach that's used by um, um, NMR, um, what's it, Line Ship Kin and the IDAP, so Evgeny Kovrigan's. Uh, software. So you can take a cross section that then you can do 1D line shape analysis on the cross sections. So this sounds you know, simple, it sounds appealing, but there's actually quite a few major problems with this. Uh, firstly, is that you, even in 2D spectra, you have overlap. And if you've got peaks that are overlapping, you, even in just some titration points, you just can't deal with it. You can't take a cross section when you've got overlapping peaks. Um, the other problem is that you have uh, normalization issues. So in a 1D experiment, you don't have a delay between your pulse and acquisition. So your integral of your peak is proportional to the concentration. Um, in a 2D experiment, this is more complicated. You have signals that are relaxing during the pulse program. What this means is that your integrals aren't proportional to the concentration anymore. So you need to normalize these individually for every spectrum. Now this is okay if you've got perfect data because you can measure this and you can normalize. But even if you've just a little bit of noise, then applying this normalization becomes very difficult. You know, it's, it's prone to just blow up wiggles in the noise. The alternative is that you fit numerically the amplitude you know, of every different spectrum for every different peak. Um, but this leads to you know, an explosion in the number of free parameters you've got. You're, you're, giving many, many more degrees of freedom to your fitting. So the fitting itself, the analysis becomes much less powerful. There's information in the fact that peak disappears, that the peak broadens out. And if you're fitting its amplitude, then that information is lost. So you end up with a less powerful analysis. Uh, another issue is that if you have slow exchange, um, it might actually be impossible to normalize both peaks simultaneously. Um, you can have differential relaxation, so the, you know, the starting peak can broaden out differently to the, the product peak. Um, and also in 2D NMR, you've got lots of different pulse programs, so uh, exchange can look different in the HSQC from an HMQC, um, because the indirect dimension, the evolution is, is different. It's a multiple quantum instead of a single quantum. So the experiment itself can you know, influence the appearance of the spectrum. Uh, and 1D, one and a half D methods just simply don't account for this. So, you know, there's a number of issues with this. So a few years ago, you, we were thinking, well, you know, there must be a better approach to this problem. And, you know, to be honest, given how long we've been running titrations for, you know, it, it surprised me that, you know, this has not been thought about earlier and that we've come up with this. But uh, the approach we took is really rather simple. And we say, well, with 1D analysis, we can predict our, our 1D spectrum and then we can try and fit it. So in exactly the same way, let's try and predict our 2D spectra um, because we know the rules of NMR, we know how spin physics works. So we can predict these things very easily. And then you know, we can drag out a region of the spectrum that we're interested in in 2D and then we can go back and we can fit this. We can use exactly the same kind of fitting algorithms uh, to do our 2D line shape analysis. Now, the details of this depend on the, the pulse program. So we need to you know, uh, model the particular pulse program we're using, the experimental settings, so acquisition times, the processing parameters. Um, but th this is not fundamentally difficult. 
So we can take in a, a sequence like HSQC and in a similar way to the blocker kernel equations, we can integrate through the different elements, our first inet transfer, the T1 evolution, the second inet transfer back again. And then we can look at the free evolution using block McConnell equations as before. We can put this together so we can simulate spectra um, very easily. So this, this was described two decades ago um, you know, by, by Alar's group. Um, and you know, our approach has simply been to take this with some numerical tweaks to make sure that the, the calculations are actually fast and efficient. Um, but, but this works pretty effectively. Um, so you, we can now build essentially a virtual spectrometer where we take all the details of our original experiments and then model this. And then we want to go back and find parameters that would actually fit our observations. And this is the idea. So yeah, an example here, we have observed titration experiments. So then you can take this, uh, simulate them, and then find your best fit parameters and get a decent agreement out. So we developed a software package called Titan Titration Analysis um, to implement this. Um, so we'll give a, a demonstration in a, in a few minutes. Um, but I think the, we've really tried to, to make it easy to use. So there's a simple graphical interface that steps you through the, the problem, steps you through the analysis. And you know, I'm very pleased that you know, it seems to be you know, you know, being taken up. So we've got over 500 users now uh, across 200 labs um, all over the world. Um, pretty much every continent. Um, so this is free to download. Um, it's also available in NMR box. Um, and there are you know, licensing um, you know, is available for, for industry if you want to get in touch. So the, the, the core of the, of the program is, um, is a sort of collection of fitting algorithm, simulation algorithms into which you can plug in the particular pulse program that you used and the settings and a particular binding model. So whether that's two-state binding, your KD and your K-off, or more complex models, like induced fits, dimerization, so forth. The interface itself um, you know, is fairly straightforward. So it's a kind of your know, flowchart-based uh, based setup. So you can work from the top to the bottom. It guides you through what to do. So you can look at a variety of different interaction mechanisms. Um, and then, you know, as we'll see, you can you know, take your spectra, you know, drag out some regions that you want to use to fit, and then you know, get, um, get your, your results out. You can fit overlapping groups of peaks, which is nice. So overlap is really not a problem. Um, and then you, you, you get your, your results out at the end. Um, I should say, I, I've marked on here residue assignments, but you, you don't need to know your assignments to, to get this. You just need to know where your peaks are going. Um, so you don't need to have assigned proteins to do this sort of analysis. So as a, a quick example, um, we were looking at the interaction of um, uh, an RRM, uh, so RNA recognition modules with two peptides, NBOX and, and NBOX3. Um, so this was data from uh, Andres Ramos's um, group, he's at UCL. Um, so this was initially acquired, um, not with the intention of doing any line shape analysis on it, this was just for a standard titration. So it kind of illustrates that you know, there's nothing special about the data we use for this. Um, you, know, you may have data sets sitting around already that you can just throw in for analysis. Um, uh, and we can take this data and you know, we can fit it quite nicely. We get you know, KDs that you know, agree with your know, previous estimates. Um, you know, we have a, a lot more precision in our estimates. And we also get the information on the dissociation rates. So we get chaos, we get kinetics as well. If we compare this measurement with one of the other peptides, with a tenfold lower affinity. And we can now see from the kinetics that that's coming about through a change in the dis dissociation rate. So it's, it's falling, the complex is falling apart more, more rapidly and that's what's leading to the reduction in affinity. Um, I just wanna point out that you, you can have a lot of data going into this. You can look at many different residues. So we have a dozen residues, 20 residues and you're getting your know, consistency across all of these. This is a global fit. So a lot of titration spectra, a lot of different residues um, so you, you have a good degree of confidence that you're getting the right results. Um, and it's important to use a few residues because you get a range of chemical shifts. So some with a large shift difference will be in slower exchange than residues with a small shift difference. It's good to, to choose a, a range of peaks. Um, and as I can, you pointed out, there's a whole range of different models that have been built into this that you can use for analysis. So I'm not going to... You, look in too much detail at the different kinds of, of models and you know, what the, 
you know, the quirks of these are, you know, it's, it's pretty straightforward. You know, the, the approach is the same for all of these. So um, before I can you know, give a, a demonstration briefly, I'll just kind of pause and see if there's any, any questions that people want to raise at this point. I'll take a little breather. Thank you, Chris. That's it's been very informative. Uh, we have a few questions from the Q and A. Um, so I'll just go through some of them here. Uh, many of them are from the first part of your talk. Okay. So an anonymous attendee asks: In the case of lines broadened to death upon the addition of a ligand, what kind of quantification can be done? That's a, a really good question, and actually, you know. That was exactly the problem that got us starting to think about this. So we were looking at the case of a protein interacting with um, a lipid membrane where we saw broadening of a lot of the residues. Um, and you know, so we, we could see that there were some residues of disordered protein. So we had some residues in the tail that were not uh, interacting. We could track those and we saw some small chemical shift changes and actually doing the analysis of those two things together so we can see the peaks disappearing. Uh, different peaks disappeared at different rates. So you know, one end of the protein was broadening out more rapidly as we added in the membrane than another chunk of the protein. Doing the analysis and all these different things, actually we could you know, fit this and it was consistent and we can see that, okay, we get a picture where, Um, well, sorry, I should say, if you don't see the peak coming back, you know, it, there are two things we don't know about it. You get the relaxation rate, you get the line width, and you get its position. So if we constrain the position, say, okay, you know, this is sticking to something big, so it doesn't really matter what the chemical shift of the new state is, we'll just, you know, we'll fix that. We won't fit that, and we'll let the line width change. So we'll let the, the line width, the bound state change. Um, so with that assumption, we could actually get quite a nice description of this. We could find the KD, the dissociation rate, uh, and we could get a picture of different parts of the protein interacting more or less strongly with the, uh, with the membrane surface. We could see large R2s at one end, we could see smaller R2s in the middle, and then we could see the tail still flexible. So it's, it's not the ideal case, but actually you, know, you, you can get a surprising amount of useful information ahead. Uh, another question from an anonymous attendee. Uh, are there any methods to take into account the NOE contribution to the exchange matrix? So, you know, we're, we're dealing with transverse magnetization here. Um, and this is not spin locked. So we don't have any longitudinal components. So I don't think there's any NOE contributions um, to this year. I mean, unless yeah, I mean, there, there shouldn't be NOE components. Similarly, there shouldn't be ROE components because you're not applying a spin lock. Um, so I, I don't think that's applicable in these cases. Great. If I've missed something there, then feel free to send me an email and we can discuss it. I have a question from Denise uh, Favreau. Can Titan be used to fit experiments performed using uh, N15 Trozy? Yeah, that's, that's a good question. It's a common question. Um, so I was going to touch on this a little bit later. Um, sort of is, is, is the answer. So um, because we are trying to model the entire pulse sequence, um, we want to only use some sort of simple pulse sequences. Um, and Trozy, the, the back transfer is a little bit complicated. It goes through lots of different magnetization states. You get a mixture of single quantum double uh, and multiple quantum magnetization that is a little bit tricky to analyze uh, when you don't know the relaxation rates. Um, to the extent that the relaxation during the back transfer isn't significant, then you can use Titan to analyze that and just pretend it's an HSQT. Um, and there are certainly published examples where people have, have used Titan in this way now. Um, you, can, you can test how big a problem this is if you um, set the essentially pretend that your J coupling is very, very large so that you cut out the, uh, the coherence transfer periods altogether. If your results are, are changing when you do that, then that's an indication that there's something going on during these times and you might want to be careful. If you can vary the length of 
the, the coherence transfer periods in the simulations and the, the Titan calculations, and you don't get any change in your results, then that's probably an indication that they're fairly robust. So yeah, it's, it's a little complicated. Um, there is also, um, there's a, a, an experiment um, that you can analyze, which is similar, which is a zero quantum troisi. Um, that's a little bit of a simpler pulse sequence. Um, and that is actually, that can be analyzed. Um, and the, the sensitivity of that is, is pretty good. It's not quite as good as a um, classical troisi, but the zero quantum component has got troisi-like qualities. So it's not, it's not as bad. And uh, we recently published a, a best variant of this sort of SOFA style, which gives very good sensitivity. So um, that, that's also an option. We have a question from an anonymous attendee that kind of maybe uh, is related or piggybacks on that last question, which is uh, the anonymous attendee writes, a not so relevant question, but it's hard for me as a novice to understand why HSQC and maybe they meant to say HMQC are different in signal intensity. Uh, can you comment on that? Um, yes, yeah. Uh, um, I'm, I'm just wondering whether it's coming uh, now or whether we should. Uh, let's. Uh... Sure. If uh, if you'd rather move on to the demonstration. Um... So let, let let me let me let me skip ahead sort of you to to this because I'm not sure with the the time if we'll actually kind of um, get to this anyway. So um, this was sort of you know, one of the sort of slightly more advanced subjects. So. As I say, in, in 2D MR, we've got these different um, exchange regimes. Um, so in the HSQC, um, and, and I will say that you know, if I touch on this briefly, you know, we published this last year, so you can you can look up the paper and and, and read a bit more. Um, so in the HSQC, your your magnetization is single quantum during T1 in the you know, indirect evolution period. So that means that the frequency difference you're comparing is is the the nitrogen frequency difference? So it's the you know, assuming we're talking you know, nitrogen. Um, so it's the you know, the nitrogen of the bone state versus the nitrogen frequency of the of the free state. Um, on the other hand, in the HMQC, you're in the T1 period. Your magnetization spends half the time as zero quantum. So you want to compare the zero quantum frequency difference, which is the um, difference in nitrogen frequencies minus the difference in proton frequencies. So you want to compare that to the exchange rate. And then it spends the other half of the time as double quantum magnetization. So you want to compare the sum of the nitrogen and the proton frequency differences to the exchange rate. And either or both of these can be in slow exchange or fast exchange or intermediate exchange. Uh, so you can actually get very different uh, behaviors. So it is one of these things that seems very strange because you think, well, it's you know you get the same kind of spectra out in the end, but the the details of how these experiments respond to exchange um, is, is actually quite quite uh, is actually quite different. Um, in general, the HMQC will give you a lot more broadening than the HSQC does, um, and that and that can be a nice thing. So you can actually uh, use that, and if you record both an HSQC and an HMQC at the same time. Um, on the same sample, I should say, then you can take these experiments and fit them both together um, or fit them both sequentially. And then you get two different measurements, two independent measurements of your, your KDs, of your association rates that you can use to increase your confidence. Great. Thanks for that very clear uh, summary. So uh, why don't we move on to your demonstration and then we can wrap up any questions at the end if there's time. Yeah, sounds good. OK, so um, can you see the, the screen OK? This is coming through. OK. So I've got uh, the, the Titan window here. So this has been launched. Um, you can either run this through MATLAB or you can download your, uh, a standalone compiled version uh, that will run. So we get versions for uh, Mac and for Linux. Uh, and it's also available on NMR box. So an NMR box, you can run it just by typing in Titan and it should run. Um, so this, this is quite available. So this is the main window. Um, and the data set we're going to look at is one of the examples that 
you know, comes with the uh, software. This is the example that I just you know, uh, talked about the uh, RRM interacting with the NBox peptide. So we've got uh, 11 different spectra here that have been acquired and we want to process these with, with NMR pipe. Um, so this is just a you know, standard NMR pipe processing script that will, will loop over the different spectra to process them. Um, only things to watch out for in the processing are that we have to use exponential window functions. We use EM window functions. These just make the calculations a little bit faster on the kind of simulation end. Um, we've got linear prediction in here, um, zero filling and so forth. Um, we've got a little bit of baselining in the direct dimension. Um, we can extract the amide region in the direct dimension. Um, it's, uh, it's important to note that you shouldn't apply any extraction in the indirect dimension. So you can baseline the indirect dimension if you really have to, although it's better to get a sequence that doesn't need baselining. Um, but you shouldn't just chop out the, the region of the spectrum that you're interested in in the indirect dimension. Uh, we can't handle that. Um, but yeah, that's that's the processing script is, is pretty straightforward. Um, so we can then you know, start the analysis. If we select our binding model, we can see here we've got a variety of built-in models. So we get the two states, interaction, protein, ligand. Uh, but there are other options, induced fit, dimerization, binding to dimers, dimers that dissociate and bind, um, competitive binding, these, these various forms. But we'll work with our two-state binding. Uh, and then we need to set up a titration point. So we want to specify our protein concentrations, ligand concentrations, um, the path of the data, and then for each experiment, the number of scans and the receiver gain that we used for this. So I've got this prepared as an Excel spreadsheet here. So I can just take this and I can uh, copy this data in this format and then just hit the, the paste from Excel. And this will be loading this in and populating this. And we can check that it's loading and okay. If we preview the spectra, then we can see this is just a, a quick representation, but we can see that these have been loaded and they look okay. Uh, I can also point out that we've you know, estimated the noise in all these different spectra because the knowing the noise level is important to you know, accurately weight the different spectra if they have different noise. Now we need to set up the pulse sequence that we've used. So these spectra were required with an HMQC. It's a SOFAST HMQC, so we can select that. And we're now asked for various details. Um, most of these should be populated correctly um, from the input data. So this was recorded at 600 megahertz. Um, you've got number of points in the direct dimension, indirect dimension. Um, you've got the window function, which has been read correctly. J coupling, about 92. And then you know, there's an approximate value for the uh, 3J coupling that's used to, to you know, that's added on essentially to, to approximate the effect of 3J coupling. If you've got deuterated material, then you would want to set this to zero because you're not going to have any um, 3J coupling. Um, that's probably the only parameter you need to worry about setting. Um, so the next stage is to set up the spins. So we want to essentially go through and you know, pick a couple of residues to analyze. So we've got a representation of the spectra here. So I'm going to use the magnifying glass, I'm going to zoom in. And there's a couple of nice peaks here that show, show nice behavior. So we can sort of center the window around here and then go into the select ROI, so select the region of interest. And then uh, we can see on the right, we've now got a kind of representation of each of the spectra. So here we're looking at the first spectra how to be living. So on the right hand panel, we just need to click to define a region that we're going to use for fitting this peak. And we right click to, to close that. Now I can keep drawing these individually. And we can see them appearing on the left. Or I can just use C to copy the previous one, copy that across. Let's do this eight, nine, 10. And so we can type in an assignment if we want, or just give a label, or just leave that as spin number one. And then we're asked to pick an estimate for the free positions, the P states. So I'm going to click on the left here, somewhere around there. And then for the bound state, it's somewhere across there. 
So we've now added in our first bin and we can OK that. Um, and let's add in one more so we can go through add spin. And if we magnify in, let's take this peak here so we can select ROIs. And in the same way, we're just going to click out a sort of envelope around here. And we'll copy that across. It's worth pointing out, you know, I've selected a region that covers the full sort of space that the peak is moving across. And that's because you know, in this final spectrum, for instance, you know, you could focus just on the observed peak, but actually there's information in knowing that there's not a signal here. So you want to, as far as possible, include the sort of full range of um, spectrum that the peak is, uh, is moving across. On the other hand, you want to avoid using you know, too much. I'm going to mark in the estimated peak positions. You want to avoid picking near regions of just noise because that's not going to contribute. So with that done, I'm going to OK that. So we've now got our two states, our two spin systems here. On the bottom panel, we've got an indication of the different parameters. So you've got the, the I and the S chemical shifts, so the direct and indirect chemical shifts for the different states of so the, the P state and for PL. And then you've got the line widths uh, at the bottom. So we're going to start off by just trying to fit the first spectrum just to get the free, uh, uh, to get the free chemical shifts. We'll fit those. And then we'll turn off the fitting of the bound state for the chemical shifts and for the line widths. And OK. The next step is to set up our model parameters. So we can get our KD, the K off. So we're going to turn off the fitting of those. And then we can select fit, a warning that you'll override the results. And we'll select just the first spectra without any ligand. And the fitting is now going to run, and it's done. So we've got our INS chemical shifts uh, fitted. We can check how that looks when we plot the overlays. And we can see that we've got now our observed spectra in blue and then our fits in red. So that's, that's what OK. Now we can go back and we say, right, let's fix our initial peaks and then fit the bound state. And we'll fit all of the line widths because these might change a little bit. We can turn on now the fitting of our model parameters. Initial guesses, pretty arbitrary, 10 and 1,000 for the KD and the K off. And when we fit, we can now select all of our spectra and run that. This window is just showing the decrease in residuals over the fitting algorithm. And it's finished already. And we can see now we get a KD of about 22 and a half ppm and a K off of about two and a half thousand ppm. Um, so that is pretty much in line with the estimate that uh, that we had um, earlier, uh, which was based on sort of, you know, 18 residues. Um, so this, this is the basic workflow. We can look at the overlays again in contour plot. Um, the plotting is one of the slowest aspects of the program, I'm afraid. Um, but that's all, uh, that's all MATLAB's fault. There's not much I can do about that. You can export fits to back to NMR pipe if you want to visualize these in, in other software. And you can save these windows. Um, you can save these images as vector graphics. You can save them as EPS files uh, for publications and they're just the contour levels. Um, but we can see here, we've got a nice, nice quality fit going along. We've got um, good agreement. We can also look at 3D plots because contour plots are sometimes a bit deceptive. It's easy to get spectra that look like they agree quite well in a contour plot. So it's worth inspecting some 3D plots. Um, we can see this here for one of the spin systems. So you've got the observed data in gray and the fits um, in pink. And we can see here, you've actually got pretty good agreement. Um, and you know, also for the, the other spin system here. Um, finally, there's a couple of options for error analysis. I'll talk about this a little bit more in the, uh, in the actual set of slides, because um, these, these take a little bit of time to run, uh, but the options are here. Um, so that's the, uh, you know, that, that's the software, that's, that's the approach. Um, so with that, I will return to the, return to the slides. Okay.
Good. So I think what we'll do now is just kind of you go through um, and discuss you know, a few tips and tricks um, of this, and then we can see if there's any um, any, any questions to, to go through at that point. Um, so in terms of the tight analysis itself and the fitting, um, so a few sort of simple tips. One is you know, not to use extensive zero filling when you're processing your spectra. Um, there's really no benefit in terms of the analysis and your calculations just get slower. Um, so you know, one round of zero filling is, is good, but I wouldn't go further. Um, I mentioned before, but uh, you want to select a variety of peatons that show large, small chemical shift changes so you can you know, get maximum sensitivity to exchange rates. Uh, on the other hand, you, know, you don't need to select every single residue in the protein. You know, your, your calculations are just going to get slower and slower. Um, you know, about a dozen is usually you know, enough. Although if you have a complex mechanism, maybe you want to go a little bit higher. Um, in general, I would say you add a few at a time you know, until you reach some sort of your convergence. You can see your parameters are, are reaching a, a steady value. Um, as, I, as I sort of showed in the demo, you want to avoid having too many free parameters at a time. So you know, a good bit of advice is to use a protein-only spectrum to fit the free chemical shifts, fixing everything else. And then you can lock those down and you get fewer parameters when you do the, the estimation. Um, if you get estimates of the KDs you know, from another method like ITC, then you could keep that fixed. So you don't actually need to fit that or use it as a starting point to get a, a better estimate. Um, it's worth noting that fitting uh, overwrites the parameters. So after you are done selecting sort of ROIs, it's worth saving a copy of your session at that point before you start to fit. So that you know, if you end up with a mess and you know, your fits have diverged and your, your estimates have flown to the other end of the spectrum, then it's easy to go back. Um, the error estimates that come up um, initially from the fitting are, are fairly quick and dirty. Um, and they usually underestimate the real uncertainty. So you can see in the main window, there are a couple of more advanced options, you know, two Monte Carlo methods um, that you should you know, try running both and then use more conservative estimates. So in terms of the optimal selection of these regions of interest, um, you know, as a sort of your general principle, you, you want to you know, avoid overlap if you can avoid it. Um, but if you do have overlap, then you can fit peaks together as a group. Um, there is an option um, to give um, a label to a spin group and then spins that have got the same label um, will be fitted together so they'll be treated as, as overlapping. Um, so that can be handled. Um, as I mentioned, you, the absence of a signal is information. So you, you don't want to select your regions that you follow a peak too closely because you know, there's information in knowing that you know, there's a peak here and not over here. You know, that's, um, that's helpful. Um, so you want to cover the entire range. Um, so you, know, you also, you don't want to cut things too closely because that you know, means you don't estimate the line widths quite so nicely, but equally you're choosing an enormous region of noise. Um, you know, that's just adding noise to your spectrum. So there's no advantage to that. Um, now, in terms of the error analysis, there's a couple of different uh, options. So uh, the first that we developed was um, a bootstrap method, so a block bootstrap. Um, and the idea of this is that you can take your, you know, your observed data, and once you do the fit, you've then got, you can calculate a residual spectrum. So you have your observed data minus the fit. And if you've got a perfect fit, then that should just be noise. And what you can do is you can then take that noise and add it shuffle it around a bit and then add it back on to your data and do the fitting again. And you can do that say a hundred times and that gives you a sort of your, um, a distribution that's like your mimics doing the experiment a hundred times. It's adding on different amounts of noise. If you do the fit results, if you do the fitting of that a you know, hundred times, then you can take statistics of that and that gives you an estimate of the, the errors when the noise is varying. Um, and you know, we did a variety of simulations of this uh, in the original uh, paper on Tyson and show that this, this does give fairly reasonable error estimates. Um, the output of the bootstrap analysis is, is summarized here. So you get your, your parameters, the value and the standard error. You can also look at the covariance matrix or the correlation matrix. So if you end up in a situation where 
some parameters are really strongly correlated with each other, like the K-off and the chemical shift difference, then you will see that you get strong peaks in your correlation metrics. So that's a, an indication that you want to be a little bit careful that maybe some parameters aren't being fully constrained. In this case, you know, this is nice and white, you know, not many off diagonal entries, that's, that's good. Uh, if you hover over this in, in the Titan program, you'll get an indication of what these parameters are as well. So um, the second error analysis approach is something called the jackknife. Um, uh, and this is pretty straightforward. If you've got 10 different spins, then 10 different residues, then you can do the fitting 10 times where you systematically leave one out. Um, and that means that you know, if your fitting has been really sensitive on one particular you know, spin or a group of overlapping spins, then you get an indication of that. So you can uh, take these. And this gives you an estimate of the model parameters um, coming out. So you know, my advice is generally you do, do both of these once you've got a final sort of fit. And then you know, choose the um, you know, choose the, the more pessimistic one, choose the one with the largest errors. Um, and that's that's been the most conservative. Um, you can also set up some shared parameters. So you can set up global parameters. So, for example, if you have dimerization, then um, you, you might want to be simulating an, an asymmetric dimer. So you get two different kinds of spins, D1, D2, for the two halves of the dimer. But maybe you have a, a symmetric dimer, so you actually want these to be the same. If that's the case, then you can set um, these, these parameters to be shared parameters. Um, so these will always be tied together. Um, finally, if you're looking at assessing the goodness of fit, um, one of the most common questions I've asked is you, where do you get the, the residuals, the chi-square score? And the chi-square score is the, the sum of the, the residuals weighted by the noise. So this comes out the fit output uh, in this column here, the f of x column, and the final row is your, is your final uh, chi-square score. But I would say that you, you, because you're dealing with pretty complex fits, um, in my mind, the best the best thing to do is actually you inspect the contour plots, 3D plots, to actually assess that you have got a good fit, that you've got good agreement. Um, so you know, the other common question I'm asked is you know, how can I calculate the reduced chi-squared for looking at um, model comparison? And the reduced chi-squared is the chi-squared divided by the number of observed points, uh, or observed points minus parameters, but the number of parameters is tiny relative to the number of observed points. In your uh, in several 2D spectra, and you know, the the rationale of this is that on average, you know, every measurement is probably going to be about one standard error away from the fit. So, you know, a good value for that is going to be about one. Um, however, you know, I really discourage the use of this um, to the point where I don't report the number of points to to let people do this um, because the reduced chi square is, is really easily rigged. Um, if you expand your ROIs to include just pure noise, empty spectrum, then you can make your reduced chi-squared as close to one as you like. Um, the number, if you want to compare models, then the number of observed points is so huge compared to the number of parameters that you know, even a tiny improvement with the more complicated model will fit better. Um, and it's really not significant. And also, you know, importantly, the observed points in NMR spectra aren't actually independent. So, neighboring points in the spectra are correlated with each other due to the effect of window functions and zero filling. So you know, actually figuring out how many you know, points you should be using, what n you should use for your reduced chi squared is also not straightforward. So all in all, you know, I would really you know, urge people not to, uh, not to try and do this sort of analysis. Um, which does lead to the question you know, people then ask, which is you know, how should I compare models? And, uh, unfortunately, this is one that I don't really have a good answer to. I don't think there's any good statistical tool. Um, you know, my advice would just be you know, to, to use your eyes and to use common sense um, over what looks reasonable and, where possible, choose the simplest model that actually accounts for your data. So, uh, finally, a few sort of practical tips for better titration data. Um, so when you're choosing concentrations for your titration, you want to be working at protein concentrations that aren't too far from your KD. Uh, if you have a, a 10 micromolar KD, then you know, somewhere between one and 100 micromolar, you're going to good sensitivity. Um, on the other hand, if you've got a one nanomolar KD, you're not going to be able to measure that accurately. 
by NMR. It's, it's too small. You need to be at comparable concentrations. Um, when you're designing your experiments, particularly if you've got a complex model, um, then try and isolate different processes. So if you're looking at binding to dimer, um, look at the dimer by itself. So vary the protein concentration to study the dimerization process and then titrate in the ligand, that sort of thing. Um, if you're doing a competition experiment, you do titrations with both of the ligands individually as well. Um, if you've got a very fast exchange, then it's really important to reach saturation because if you don't, then it's very hard to distinguish between a strong interaction that's got a, a small chemical shift perturbation and a weak interaction that's got a large one. Um, in terms of the NMR experiment itself, if you want to do an accurate titration, you find you're continuously taking samples out of the NMR tubes, petting them out to mix with a new bit of ligand, petting them back in, you inevitably lose volume. And that means that you've got errors in your protein concentrations, your ligand concentrations. Um, when I'm doing titrations, the approach I generally take is to pet, pipette the ligand stock directly into the top of the tube, put the cap on, and then mix it back and forth a few times. Um, that seems to work pretty nicely. You don't lose volume. Um, similarly, you really want to avoid using three millimeter tubes and Shigemi tubes, um, unless you're actually preparing a series of different samples uh, for each individual point. Uh, and then um, pulse sequencing, this is a, a point that's been made. So Trozy experiments are, are tricky. You know, if you can avoid them, then um, you're best to do that. Uh, also, the sensitivity enhanced HSQC is another problem. So I would use, wherever possible, use a regular HSQC because the back transfer in the, in the sensitivity enhanced experiment is very complicated. Uh, and lastly, you, it's really important to get good baselines when you're doing this sort of analysis. And many of the, the pulse programs and, and standard libraries um, have really poor baselines, you know, first order phase corrections in direct and indirect dimensions. So you know, it's easy to find optimized sequences that have got zero first order phase correction in the direct dimension and have got either zero or um, 180 first order phase correction in the indirect dimension. Um, if you don't have sequences like that, they are provided with downloads of Titan, and I would really urge you to, to use these. And, also kind of urge um, vendors to, to clean up the libraries because um, this is, is so trivial. Um, so a lot of these tips we've taken from um, a protocol we published uh, last year. Um, it's, it's a lovely volume on IDPs, um, but although it's a volume on IDPs, you know, most of these you know, points are actually you know, equally applicable to um, you know, all sorts of interactions. Um, they're, it's pretty general. Um, finally, um, you, know, you can ask, well, you know, what are the signatures of these you know, more complex uh, interaction mechanisms? Um, th this is pretty complicated because you've got an enormous number of degrees of freedom, um, particularly in two dimensions where you've got all these different sorts of uh, exchange regimes. Um, I can't really cover you know, this in, in a single you know, topic. I mean, it, it, it's you, you, you can see so many things or, or, or not see evidence of different mechanisms. Um, but I would point you to, to a really lovely article from Evgeny Kovrigan um, about 10 years ago in JBNMR, where he's systematically analyzed some of these uh, different sort of setups of conformational selection uh, and just fit, uh, at least in the 1D sense. So um, if you think you've got this sort of behavior, then this is a good article to take a look at, and it can give you a, sort of, you know, a picture of where to, where to begin thinking. Um, so with that, I think it's probably a good point to, to end and, and take any, any final questions. Thank you. Thank you very much for that wonderful and detailed demonstration. Um, we have a couple of final questions. Um, a question uh, from Marin Saberi. Uh, asks, if the bound state ES complex undergoes some conformational change leading to another form of ES complex, both in equilibrium and both detectable in HSQC, uh, how would the fitting proceed? OK, yeah. So, so that is, that, that's exactly an example of, of induced fit, where you have got you know, an equilibrium after the binding event. So um, and if you can see both of these, then, then that's great, because that's, that's a really nice situation. You know, it's always better to have stuff that you can see. Um, 
So it sounds like in that case here, the appropriate model to fit would be an induced fit model um, where you've got these two states. Um, so you know, it, it should be possible to handle these things. Um, and I, I think you know, the, these models are, are built in and they're available. Question from uh, Genevieve Seabrook. Uh, can Titan also analyze 13C and or N15 peaks and peak broadening? Um, so, yeah, absolutely. So the, um, yeah, the examples I've shown here were uh, amide data, but you can certainly you know, look at um, methyl groups. So I think some methyl trosy, the HMQC is great. Um, if there are other experiments um, looking at carbon, um, you know, if you want to look at the, the C alpha, CH sort of spectra, uh, it should be possible to look at that. We've not, I've not had any users with any interest in that, but if that's something that's of interest, I can't see any obstacles. So um, yeah, feel, feel free to, to send me an, an email um, and I can, yeah. If we need to uh, adjust any of the, the built-in sequences, we can do that. We have a, a multi-part question from, from an anonymous attendee, uh, but I think it, it maybe will be uh, interesting to go through. So the anonymous attendee asks, uh, how uh, for advice for setting up model fitting parameters for a reliable result, uh, saying even a small change in the initial parameters yields a different KD and K off, and also says that I noticed the program tends to round off the protein ligand concentration, ligand concentrations. Uh, how can you make sure it uses the exact concentrations? Um, so I, I don't think there's any rounding of the input concentrations. Um, if there is, that's a bug and, uh, and get in touch. Uh, it might just be that when it's, it's displayed, um, these are rounded. Um, just to, um, so I, I think, yeah, protein and ligand concentrations in output figures are rounded to make it look nice. Um, but the exact concentrations are always used in the analysis. Um, in the case where you've got real um, sensitivity to the input parameters, um, that's probably ultimately a sign that you're, 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 you're fitting landscapes, so the, the chi squared landscape is, is very rough and you're getting you know, you know convergence into lots of different local minima um, so you know, that that's probably an indication that you know maybe you need to include some more residues or you know, that you've got you know, that, that something's not being pinned down closely so um, if you're looking at a complex model perhaps there's not enough information there to constrain some of the parameters involved in that so you know a slight perturbation just sends it to, to somewhere else because um, yeah generally if your fitting is, is robust then it shouldn't be too sensitive on the initial parameters um, so that that might be a sign that you know it's it's being stretched a little bit far or or you need to throw in a wee bit more data Thank you. Uh, another answer from an anonymous attendee. The fit sometimes gives the following error. Warning, matrix is close to singular or badly scared, scaled. How does one troubleshoot this? And follow up, wonderful talk, thank you. Um, I, th I think, um, so, I mean, if, if you want to be sure, then um, you can send, send me an email directly. And um, in, in general, if people want to, you know, raise bugs and things it's helpful to save the session and then send the session file across um i i would guess that that error is coming up at the end of a fit when you're trying to calculate the errors and that is probably a sign that some of the parameters are very highly correlated um so for instance if you have a you know fast exchange um and you're not reaching saturation then you know, it might be very difficult to determine you know, to, to separate out the KD and the chemical shift perturbations. Um, or if your peaks are getting completely broadened out upon binding, it might be that you're actually, well, you, do you make the, the, the proton chemical shift, uh, you know, the proton line with big or the, the indirect line with big and you get some ambiguities there. So if it's in the fitting results, I think that's an indication that there's a sort of, you know, um, that there's a sort of ambiguity. 
Great question from an anonymous attendee. Thanks for a really interesting tutorial. Why do you advise against three millimeter tubes? Um, simply because, I mean, if, if you're preparing a set of, you know, a dozen samples to measure, you know, in a sample changer, then that's fantastic. Um, if you're trying to do titration and taking the samples in and out of three millimeter tubes, I think you're going to lose control of your volume. So you're going to get systematic errors in, in concentrations. Um, that would be my, my concern. All right. Uh, we have one kind of question from the beginning part of the talk. Uh, maybe it's quick to answer. Uh, an anonymous attendee asks, uh, this is, I think, from the block equations. Uh, M naught, should M naught be a two by two matrix uh, in the form of, and then the identity matrix was drawn? Oh, no. So, so M, M, M naught, so that the, that's simply a vector. That's a, a vector of the, um, of the magnetizations. So, um, yeah, so, so it would be the, the, the initial magnetization of you know, uh, state A, you know, presumably along the x-axis, so just a real number, and, and B, uh, you know, along the x-axis, real number. So it's the, it's the vector of, of amounts. Great. And then since there's only one more question, I might as well ask it from Ben Davis. Uh, uh, great talk. Thank you. Is it possible to convert Bruker? Uh, to, uh, this, this is a file conversion question. Convert Bruker to RR to NMR pipe format, or do we need to reprocess with NMR pipe? Um, yeah, good, good question. So um, at the moment, you need to reprocess. Um, but I have actually been working on um, the direct import of Bruker files. Um, so yeah, what, watch this space. I think in the, in the not too distant future, um, it should be possible to import Bruker files directly.